Well, I'm happy and excited to be here. And uh, let me start right away. When I was thinking about this topic of uh, inner healing, actually, you know, Joe had this whole thing like he reserved the rooms and he says, now you get up and talk. I said, about what? <laughs> anything. He says, we told them we're going, to, we're going to have a program on hope and healing. And I like the topic right away. So I said, let me talk about uh, healing, at least the first three sessions, the first three sessions, healing, the inner healing, you know, how, I, how do I heal myself? Then once I heal myself, then I can reach out and work with my personal relationships. You know, and then reach out to trying to heal and spread peace in the world. So while I was thinking about this topic of uh, inner healing, there were two things that came to my mind right away. One was my mother. And I don't know why she came to my mind. You know, she has died long ago, but she's still alive. You know, mothers' voices never die. <laughs> they control our lives even 50 years after the dead and gone. But I love my mother. And so what I remembered about her was one time, uh, when we were in Lourdes, you know, we had gone there and she had all this devotion that she went and took the bath, she went and prayed the rosary. I did most of the things, but not the bath. You know. But she came at the end of that visit, while we were leaving, she made a statement. Until this day, my siblings and I are trying to figure out what my mother meant by that. She said, I was healed, but not cured. Or I was, I was not cured, but I was healed. And about two months after that, she died. You know, uh, and that set me thinking, you know, healing and being cured. So there are certain parts of our lives that probably will never be cured, but we can always be healed. Okay, so that was the first thing that I, was, I thought about. And the second thing that I thought about was a Zen story. And the Zen story is probably, if you read my book, it's there. And if you haven't read my book, you heard it. But we're gonna use this for today's, uh, for today's session. So the Zen story is about uh, this, um, I think it was, there was a war. And there was this general who just went from village to village, town to town, and just slaughtered everyone that came, you know, in his way. So he's, his reputation preceded him. So when people heard that he was coming, they all ran away. So he enters this village, and of course, everybody ran away except one man. He sat there, and he was in meditation. And the general went to him and said, do you know who I am? He said, yes. And do you know I could run my sword right through you without batting an eye? And the man said, and do you know who I am? <laughs> he said, no. He said, I would let you do it without batting an eye. And the Zen story goes that the general bowed before that man and left. Now that's what inner healing is all about. To find the strength, to find the freedom to be able to live in the most painful, hurtful situations of our lives. Is it possible? Yes. Let me share with you a couple of my own experiences. Again, when I was thinking about this inner healing and inner freedom, I said, well, and I thought about the Zen story. I said, oh, this is fantastic, but is it practical? Is it possible? And then when I reflected on my own life, I said, yes, I have experienced this. Because a few years, many years ago, I was in Bombay, and uh, one of the Hindu fundamentalist political groups had called for a strike. And it was like, you know, they had closed down everything. So they didn't want anybody on the streets. And I was on my motorbike because I had to reach somebody home. It was an emergency. So as I was driving this person and dropping this person off 
to like you know to where they where they where they stay, I saw them a group of them getting a hold getting hold of another motorcyclist. They put him aside. They broke his bike and they were beating him up. And I said, uh oh. So I turned around, and as I turned around, of course they stopped me and took my keys. There were 50 of them. And I stood there, and of course my weapon is my mouth. So, <laughs> so I got a hold of one of the guys whom I found was reasonable, and I kept talking and talking and talking to him. You know, to say, this was an emergency, I had to do this. They said, did you not know that you're not supposed to be here? I said, I know, but I have to do this. What would you have done if you were in my place? So I was giving them a talk. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so then I said, I was a Christian, and they said, oh yeah, you're anti, you're a foreigner. I said, I don't care what you think. I said, this. So I kept talking to them until one of the police guys came on his motorbike and said, give me a key, and the two of us rode off. After I went home, then I began to shudder I said, <laughs> because I could have been beaten up. I could have been, and I've and I've been in those situations more than once. You know, one time in the middle again in Bombay, there were two. There was a gang fight, and I was there, right? And I'm not, you know, not a, I'm not Arnold Schwarzenegger where I can just just beat him. No, but I was. I stopped two of them from fighting, and of course they said. We are from the same gang. I said, I don't care. Go home. And they went. You know, because there is power in each one of us to experience that freedom. And when we are put in situations, it brings out the best in us. Those of you who heard me know that one of my best friends, you know, who was a Jesuit, worked in the north of India. And he was little. But he could stand up to police guys in the middle of the road and challenge them. He would look them in the eye and challenge them. Without batting an eye, he could confront them. And they listened to him until one day they got a hold of him. They tortured him and they beheaded him. Yeah. But, you know, his life has, like, has the fruit of that, of, of what he went through, is abundant. That whole neighbor, neighborhood, the whole village, the whole town has changed and been transformed because he empowered people. He taught people nonviolence. He taught people to run through, you know, to allow people to run through you without batting an eye. Of course, I come from the country of Mahatma Gandhi, who taught us nonviolence. But nonviolence comes from power. Nonviolence comes, and Mahatma Gandhi's whole movement was not nonviolence. It was not ahimsa, which is nonviolence, but it, is, it was satyagraha. Satya, and that's what I'll talk about today too. Satya is the essence. Satya is truth, literally. But for Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi, it was the essence of life. And what is the essence? Where we find our identity in the divine essence and experience an interconnectedness of all of life because all of life is filled and charged with the divine essence. So whatever happens to one of us affects the rest of us. So Mahatma Gandhi went and told the British, if you're hurting us, you're hurting yourself. Archbishop Tutu, Nelson Mandela in South Africa had the same message. If you exclude us, you're, you're missing a part of yourself. We are all interconnected, okay? So the freedom and the power that, you know, that we have comes from finding who we are. Uh, I'm teaching this little, I'm teaching the community college, so I asked them, I said, I'm gonna give this talk on inner healing. Give me one thought, what would you say? And the girl right away said, forgiveness. You've got to learn how to forgive. You've got to learn how to forgive yourself. You've got to learn how to forgive other people. And what is forgiveness? My uh, understanding of forgiveness is you only forgive when there's nothing to forgive. You only forgive when there's nothing to forgive. And you never, never, never forgive and forget. Yeah. 
It is always good to remember, to remember, and to remember. Because if you forget, you'll continue to be hurt. If you forget, you'll continue to hurt other people. Okay? So what is forgiveness? And so forgiveness is going back to our painful hurts and finding the gift. Finding the gift. And then I can look back at the same painful, hurtful situations without feeling the pain and without feeling the hurt. And I feel comfortable. Okay? I'm going to kind of go through several, but let me give you, just to explain, because I'm saying, you'll be saying, what is he trying to say? You never forgive and there's nothing to forgive. Never forgive and for, like, you know, don't forgive and forget. I'm going to tell you something that some of you, again, have heard me say before. When I first came to this wonderful country, in 1988, I was so lost because outside the United States, we are told that you are the greatest, the best, the smartest, the everything, you know. And so I came here and I was living in the Jesuit community with all those who feel they are even greater than the rest of the world. And so I felt intimidated, I felt insecure, I felt completely lost. So in that first month, what did I do? I did what I always did at home, went to the church to pray. Help me, God. I'm lost. And while I was there in the evening, before the evening mass, what do you think happened? The guy came up to me and said, get up. You will leave the church now. And I looked and I was, I was shocked. He said, you heard me. Get up. I wasn't white. And so he asked me, to leave the church to get up. Now, I'm not looking for pity. I've already got mileage on this. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with this. But the reason I'm telling you this is it hurt me for about a year or two years because I was new. I was lost until I realized that you are just like any one of us. You know, you are smart, we are smart. And whether you're smart or all of us need the same thing. Attention, love, care, you know, those are basic needs that all of us need. Even if you pretend you don't, yes, we do. Okay? So for the first two years since I had couldn't forgive, couldn't forgive, I used to say all kinds of crazy things. You know, well, the sun rises in the east, you get what is left over. <laughs> we have the thing you don't. The wise men came from the east. It's difficult to find them. So these, are, what was I? Do? And when I when I think back, I'm saying like, well, I was reacting because I was hurt. Okay. Now that I have understood, or I can go back and I say, okay, it was just as one person. Maybe he represented the church. Even if he did, I don't think he does. But even if he did, what does it matter? Today, people still. Some, every now and then to discriminate against me, but I've learned not to be hurt. I feel sorry for them. I do, because it's coming out of ignorance, and it's their loss, you know, if they discriminate against me. So I don't take that personally anymore, because I've learned and I don't want to forget, you know. And as long as I remember that experience, I'm not going to get hurt by, by anybody discriminating against me. You know, when I was teaching at Lindenwood, there was a little student of mine, she was a gymnast. She would correct my accent throughout the whole semester. That was fun. She was a good student. Don't, I don't take it personally. By remembering, by remembering, since I know how much it hurts, I do not discriminate against other people. I do not. You know, I love people. I may not agree with, with behavior. I may not agree with, you know, with what you and I say, but you, I will always love. I will always love. And I will not discriminate against other people because I remember how it hurts. Okay, now to help us to be able to say, you know, to, I said I'm going to use a psycho-spiritual approach for this topic. So there are, there are two things that I thought about. One was Freud. 
I love Freud. And um, the thing I like about Freud is, I mean, not, I don't like everything about Freud, and I don't agree with everything about Freud, but there are certain basic things of Freud that we cannot get away with. For example, Freud believes that the first six years of our lives are the most influential part of our entire lives. So the way we experience the first six years, you know, will play out the rest and the rest of our lives. So it is important if you want to be healed, the inner healing, we need to go back to the first six years of our lives in order to see what was my experience. So if I felt accepted, loved, cared for, yes, I grew up and I attract, you know, acceptance, love, and care. If I, if I, in my first six years of my life, if I felt that I was like looked down upon or treated negatively, I grew up feeling negative too. Okay. So what was the experience of the first six years of my life? Did I feel accepted? Did I feel loved? Was I rejected? Was I hurt? It's important. Okay. Now my school of psychology believes that the past influences my present, but need not control my present and determine my future. Those controls are in my hands. I tell my students at, at like, you know, at all, all the college, don't, I don't ever want to hear from any one of my students to say, I'm like this because my parents were like that. One of my students one time came to me and said, I just want you to know, you know, I'm like this because my father was an alcoholic. And I said, really? I said, your father probably started drinking after you were born. So, <laughs> <laughs> grow up, take responsibility for your life. Don't go through life like in the same, for blaming your past, blaming your parents. I said, yes, maybe your parents were messed up. Yes, maybe your past was, was really difficult and bad. But don't go through life saying, you know, using that as an excuse. Influence you? Yes. Control you? No. Determine your future? Unless you give it permission, it cannot determine your future. But it is, this is easier said than done. But it is, it can be done. I mean, look at the alternative. Do you want to live miserable for the rest of your life just because something happened in your past? Or do you want to do something about it? I'm sure you want to do something about it, that's why you're here today. You know, to say, how can I heal myself from within? It's possible. It's possible. Okay? So we go about our lives. Now, I have met, like, let's see, uh, back home in India, I have met a number of women who were sexually molested and abused as children. Now, that hurt is deep. That hurt can be everlasting. But even those women, are living a full life. They have experienced inner healing and they've experienced freedom. Now, you could run a sword right through them without batting an eye and they'll let you do it. But they're not afraid. They're not afraid and they're not going to be affected anymore. So these are women that would, t that would, come, to, uh, no, I would be able to come to talk to me and I'll give you an example of one or two of them. And so, you know, so they started talking and talking and talking, and I asked them to repeat what they said and repeat what they said till it kind of, you know, in a way it kind of normalizes. They don't feel judged by me. Then I kind of help them to find their identity and their source. And somewhere along the way, they, they will come up and say, I have forgiven all those people that have molested me and said and abused me. I said, you what? They said, yes, I have. And by the way, if you don't forgive, Who's the one that suffers? You. If you don't forgive, it is like taking poison and waiting for somebody else to die. They don't. It kills ourselves. We, it festers within us, you know, if we don't forgive. These are people who are, and then I told them, you're not going to forget any of the abuse that you've experienced. So what do they do? How do they remember? These women now are going to colleges are going to universities, are going to, are going to kindergarten, like you know, talking to parents and telling their stories. So these are women who will talk about their abuse, how they were sexually abused at different stages of their life. They're not ashamed, you know? They're not ashamed. 
And that, by the way, is another thing that I will say. By the way, I was just teaching my students today. You know, coming out of the closet is not only coming out to say that I'm gay or lesbian. All of us have got our skeletons. All of us have got something hidden in our closet that we are holding on with our dear life. Coming out of our closet is to share that with somebody that cares about you, that loves you. Honestly, directly, without mincing words, and without, uh, without apologizing. You don't have to apologize for what. So these are women who will say clearly, I was sexually molested and abused by, you know, maybe my uncle, may, may not say that, may, may not name the uncle, but by my, my own relatives, or by my father. My father may have died when my, I was molested by my father, sexually abused by my father. Clearly, directly, I was molested and abused, and I'm not going to apologize. I'm not ashamed, okay? So to be able to admit that, honestly, directly, without ambiguity, and without apologizing, okay? It's like I told you, I was thrown out of the church because I was not white, and I don't apologize for that. Why? And so you will feel comfortable with me to say, you know, this guy's like, he's okay. You know, because he can talk about this without being angry. I'm not angry, I'm not hurt, I'm not, you know, no longer hurt or angry. So now these are, these are women who help other people with their own abuse. So this is a woman who, after talking to the university, very often, when she comes home, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, the phone will ring. And there's a girl from the university who will say, ma'am, what you were talking about was me, my story. I am being, I am, I'm sexually abused at home, and I've run away from home. And this lady will say, now where are you? I'm coming to pick you up. She does not drive. The husband wakes up, you know, he gets the car ready. They'll go and bring the girl home, and she can stay there as long as she needs to. But while she's at home, you know, she, uh, the, 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 the woman and this girl are talking, the husband goes to the kitchen, prepares a cup of coffee, you know, like she will prepare coffee or tea, whatever, and give it to them. And she has transformed people. Why? Because she has been healed. Now, if those can be healed that were molested, abused as children for years, you and I can too. But we need to go there into our closets. Into our closets. You know, don't die with that, that weight. Look at it and find your healing in that closet. You know, bring it out. Talk about it openly. Do not apologize, okay? because there is power in brokenness. Who said that? St. Paul <laughs> said, you know, when I'm weak, power is made perfect in weakness. Power is made perfect in weakness, you know, and that's a very powerful statement. So when we are weak, then we are strong. So don't be afraid of your weakness. Don't be afraid of your pain. Don't be afraid of kind of, you know, of, of looking at it, becoming aware of it, bring it out, acknowledge it, and don't apologize. And once you get healed, okay, that's, that's, that's the part of the first six years. There's another part that Freud says. Freud talks about father. He says, God is a projection of our father image. Now, the way we experience our fathers in the first six years of our lives will also determine the rest of our lives. Now, you know, you can say, well, you know, God is a projection, of, but I call God mother. It doesn't matter. In the collective unconsciousness of, of Christians, God is still father. And so the way we experience our fathers in the first six years of our lives is the way we'll, ex we'll experience authority the rest of our lives. So whoever has authority in society, at home, at work, etc., you know, we project our relationship with our father onto all these authority figures. 
Let me give you a couple of examples. Again, you'll find that in, you know, in my book I talk about uh, this guy who came to talk to me and he said, in my family we have a custom that you never say long prayers because if you say long prayers, you get into trouble. And I said, yes, that's my kind of, you know, <laughs> pray quickly and then. So, but then he started explaining to me his relationship with his father. His father was in the Indian army. So nine months of the year, he's out there defending the country against the enemy. Three months, he comes home and brings the, you know, there's military rule at home. Sit straight, do this, don't like, you know. And um, uh, so, it's military rule at home. Then he'll call his mother and yell at his mother to say, this is not the way to bring up my children, not even our children, my children. <laughs> and then of course, poor dad, nine months, he's got tension on the borders. So he comes home and starts drinking. And when he gets, when he gets drunk, he, was, he used to abuse his, his mother, beat them up and do all kinds of crazy things. So they would wait for father to go and defend the country against the enemy so there would be peace at home. <laughs> so now when he goes to pray, what kind of a God does he encounter? The same military God. God is a military God. And he wants that God, like so quickly, let God go and take care of the rest of the world and leave yourself in peace. Now this guy, he turned every authority into a military person. You could give him the kindest boss. In a short time, he will turn that boss into a military man or a military woman. We project. So Freud, you know, he was crazy, but he wasn't stupid. You know, so there, are, there are different things that Freud said, but there is a lot of sense in what he was saying. So if Freud, when he said, talked about like, you know, father being, like the God being a projection of our father image, there is a lot of truth. So if we want to be healed, yes, we need the divine power. Yes, we need, you know, we need, uh, we need God to help us. But who's that God? Your father. Your father. Okay? So we need to be able to, you know, well, like, you know, like love our fathers, love our mothers, and say thank you very much. <coughs> Leave me alone now to live my life. <laughs> it's because I love you. I want to kind of, you know, to be able to, <clears throat> uh, yeah, again, you know, remember that story about uh, Archbishop Tutu said, <clears throat> when the missionaries first came to Africa, they had the Bible, we had the land, and the missionaries said, let us pray, and when we open our eyes, we had the Bible. Mm -hmm. They had our land. <laughs> the Bible and land are symbols. Okay? Land for the African gives them the identity. You take away the land from the African, you make them less of a person or a non-person. You take away the land from the Native American, and guess what, what, what has happened to them? You know, they've been destroyed as persons, as human beings, as a community. So land, so the question that I ask is, like, who's... Whose Bibles do you have and who's got your land? You know, we've got our father's Bible, we've got our mother's <coughs> Bible, we've got our family Bible, we've got our church Bible, we've got our community Bible, we've got our cultural Bible. It's time to give away all those Bibles, including the Bible, take back your land, write your own scriptures, and take responsibility for your life. So we need to be able to give back, you know, like what my father gave me. He gave me a gift of questioning. So guess what? I questioned everything that he said to me. And we, he was okay with it, you know. So was with, so with my mother. So was like, you know, like Holy Mother the Church, you know. And my culture, my community, I keep questioning, questioning, questioning. And as I question, I write my own scriptures and take responsibility for my own life. I do not want, you know, when St. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, I ask you, <coughs> it's no longer you who live, but who's living? <coughs> Whose life are you living? Are you living your life, or are you living somebody else's life? Okay, so the last part, like, uh, I will talk about this, and then I like to open this up to conversation. So I, I love questions and I love, love the conversation.
So how do I, like, you know, what, what, does it, what does it mean to forgive? How do I forgive and what's, what are the consequences? The consequences of forgiveness is finding myself as I am. Who am I? Who am I? So if you want to be really, truly healed, the key to, to inner healing is finding my identity, not just a, an idea of who I am, but feeling it in my gut, feeling it in my consciousness. Okay? Let's go through, uh, like, the different scriptures. Let's take the Bible. What does the Bible say about who I am? The first chapter of Genesis says, by the way, God did not create Adam and Eve. That's a story. Okay? That's a myth. So, but that's a myth about the first man and the first woman. So God, even if you take that myth, that God created Adam and Eve and made Adam and Eve into God's own image and likeness. And God saw that what God created was very good. So my identity from the first chapter of Genesis is, I'm the image and likeness of God, created good and beautiful. And whether you like it or not, you cannot change it. Whatever you may do, you cannot change. That is our essence. And once I find that essence, I'm healed. Because my body can be broken. I can be hurt in different ways, but not my essence. My essence is whole. But I need to come to that. So that's the first chapter of Genesis. The second chapter of Genesis is my favorite. So there are two stories already. So if you take one story, you say, that's what the Bible says. I tell you, no, that's another one. And the other one is in the second chapter. Soon after that, God takes dirt and makes it into the shape of a man and then breathes into that dirt God's own breath and then we became human. So who am I? That's my identity. I'm the divine breath. I'm the divine breath. And you cannot touch that, contaminate that, hurt that. It's whole. And once I experience, you know, the divine breath, I'm powerful. You can run right through me, but you cannot touch the divine breath. I'm free. Okay? So, the second chapter of Genesis, what, what, so, this body is the 2015 model. <laughs> the 2014 is gone. You know, it's not the, bo the body that I had as a child, and it's probably not the body that I'm going to, like, you know, have when I die. The body changes. My thinking changes, my feelings change, change, okay? Everything changes, my essence is the breath. I love that, you know, I'm the divine breath. So that is so powerful because um, where do I find God? In my breathing. I don't have to go to the temple or to the mountain. I just breathe and I can find God. Where do I find God? In the universe. Because that breath is part of the universe. So my, when I find my identity and I live, you know, sometimes if I get anxious or if I'm fearful or something, or I'm hurt, I just sit and I breathe. Of course, there's another thing that helps me. You know, in my, in my, in my home, I've got picture, two pictures of the laughing Jesus. It's a copy, the same laughing Jesus, the two pictures. So, if I'm taking myself too seriously or life too seriously, I'm saying, I'm, I look at him and he goes, ha! Ah. Okay, ha! Ah. So, that's my Jesus. He says, laugh. You're taken care of. This too will pass. You know, and gives me that freedom. It gives me that energy. It gives me that power to be able just to say, ha! Ah. You know, so, and then my breathing. So, I just, I just sit and I breathe. And I seriously breathe. And in my breathing, I find myself. And in my breathing, I find my God. In my breathing, I find healing. And I find the universe. It's all in the breath. Who tells me that? The Bible. The Bible. My religion, of course, will tell me, you're a damned sinner. You know? You have that original sin. What is original sin? I don't know anything about, never knew anything about original sin except that it was original. <laughs> Somebody made it up. Somebody made up that sin to put fear and guilt in all of us. You know, I took the, my, you know, the, um, for us, original sin is ignorance. So when you forget who you are, you're in sin. 
You know, when you forget who you are, when I forget that I'm the image of God, likeness of God, and the divine bread, then I'm in sin. Why? Because if I don't see it in me, I'm not going to see it in any one of you. If I don't see the divine bread in me, I'm going to criticize you. I'm going to find fault in you. I'm going to see, like, negativity everywhere. And every now and then, I do criticize people. I do feel negative, and I'm human. So I do that. And then as soon as I catch myself doing it, I don't go and beat myself. I go back, I go into my room, and I breathe. And once I find the divine bread, I can go back to the same people and be kind and be nice and be different. <coughs> Sometimes I may apologize, but most of the times, you know, they, they haven't even noticed because I'm boiling inside. And I've said something vicious that only I know. They, they think it is funny. No. But, <laughs> but you know, but when I find my, the way I heal myself, it's just by breathing, breathing, breathing. Okay? So it's in my breath. That is my secret, my key to being healed. I may not be cured, but I'm healed. You know? Because I'll tell you what, there are some, like I tell people, we've got only one grace and only one sin. And whatever you do, you cannot get rid of that sin. You know, those like Catholics who go to confession, I, I, was, I tell people, some of the older people, older Catholics, I said, you know, if you're still going to confession, I bet you're confessing the same sins that you were confessing when you were 20 years old. You know, you change the name a little, you know, theological name, and you read something and you bring. So I was talking to one of the older men one time, and I said, isn't that true? I don't want to know your sins, but aren't you confessing the same sins when you're 20? And he says, well, most of them. I said, I know. Now all the interesting sins have left you. <laughs> you know, left you the boring sins that you've got to confess. So, but that is when we can be healed without being cured. You know, you're, you're going to die in that sin. We're going, to go to, we're going to go to our grave with that. You know, Paul tells us. You know, when Paul says, you know, that three times I prayed to, pray to the Lord to deliver me from this thorn in the flesh. And God said, you'll die of that. You know, you'll die of that. My grace is sufficient for you. And power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul said, what shall I say? I shall boast of my weakness, because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And Paul died with his, like, you know, with his anger. That man was angry. I don't know whether you read the, you read the scriptures, but we, we, they have colored it with language, you know. Like Paul is, like, Paul is fighting against those Judaizers who want to circumcise all his pagans before, before they baptize them. And he's fighting them. He says, in Jesus, you don't need to be circumcised. In fact, Paul doesn't even baptize. He only preaches the good news to them, you know. So when they're, when they're so bent on circumcision, his, his anger, his, his tolerance reaches its limit. So he's writing in Galatians chapter 5, read that, I'm not making this up. He said, if you believe in circumcision so much, why do you cut only a little tip, cut the whole damn thing off? <laughs> <laughs> so that's Paul, when he gets upset, when he gets upset, he, that's in the Bible, okay? So it is okay to be cured, not to be cured as long as we are healed. You know, as long as we're healed. So that's the Bible. What about, like, you know, the, the Hindu scriptures? Uh, okay, even if the Bible, let's, since we are talking about Paul, Paul talks about, you know, if uh, uh, the Spirit helps us to call God Father. If, if you call God Father, you're a child. You're a child of God. And if you're a child of God, Paul says, you're a divine heir. You're an heir. Which means, if you really believe that you're a child of God, then you're a divine heir. And if you're an heir, everything that God is and everything that God has belongs to you as a right. Not a privilege, as your right. That's what St. Paul says. You know the story of the prodigal son? You know, when the prodigal son, the older brother is saying, so many years I've, I've like, you know, he was probably an American. So many years, <laughs> yes, he says, so many years I've slaved for you, never disobeyed any one of your law, keep the law, like, you know. And you did not so much as give me a kid goat, like it's a reward kind of, you know, spirituality. And the father saying, son, everything I have is yours. Everything. Not half, not three-fourths, everything. But you don't know how to receive it. You think you've got to earn. 
You don't consider yourself a child. What does the older brother say? For so many years I've slaved for you. He's lost his identity. This prodigal younger brother's a son. The older brother's a slave. And slaves have no rights. And slaves don't know how to, cannot claim the inheritance. But son, yes, even though he has messed up, the father doesn't even talk about, you know, talk about what he has done. He's just happy that he is that the son has showed up so that he can celebrate, so that the father can show up. You know, there are three things I'm, I'm digressing. But I'm from India. We like we walk, we go, we are like a crab. We go sideways and not go forward. <laughs> But this, there are three things I tell people, I, you know, one of the things I tell my, my, my students, I said, guess what I do for fun? I help people to die. Yeah. Which is true. I mean, it's not fun, fun. It gives me tremendous pleasure and joy to help somebody. Because, you know, when you're old, when you're old and, and you're closer to death, death is not an idea. It's a reality. So people are afraid. So there are three things I tell them. First, I believe in God, who is the father of the prodigal son, waiting for us to show up so that God can show up. How wonderful God is. God doesn't care about what we have done. He just cares that we have arrived. You know? The second thing I tell them is this. If you think you can offend God by your sins, you must be arrogant. You must be arrogant. Who are you? This little, tiny little creature? You can offend your mighty God? No, you cannot. We hurt ourselves. You cannot hurt God. We offend ourselves. You cannot offend God. God is too big for that. God is too, 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 too big for that. So forget about, like, you know, worrying about hurting God. God doesn't need inner healing. <laughs> God is like, you know, God is too big for that. You cannot hurt God. And the third thing I tell people is, you know, the challenge of a loving relationship is not to love. The challenge of a loving relationship is not to love. The challenge of a loving relationship is to allow myself to be loved. Because the only love that I can give to other people is the love that I've allowed myself to receive. All other love becomes selfish manipulation and it will come back to hurt you. Love that flows that is not received will come back to hurt you. So we've got to learn how to receive love. Okay? Um, you know, at the end of every day, see, I have no problem sleeping. One, because I don't have a conscience. Two, <laughs> I do have a conscience. But the reason why I do sleep well is because I always go to sleep with gratitude. You know, I always look for something that happened during the day that maybe I was too busy to pay attention to. Someone who was trying to reach out to me. Someone who was trying to say something loving, you know, somebody who was kind to me, or did something, you know. So I think about that, and I just soak that in, and I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. So I take that in, okay? So that's like, you know, when you're, like, if, you, if you're, like, in, 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 in a, if you're a couple, you know, like, don't go to sleep every night saying, what more can I do for this other, for this other guy? I thought he was going to be for 20 years, it's 40 years, he's still around. <laughs> <laughs> you could say the same thing about her. So, <laughs> it is 40 years. <laughs> so rather than saying, what more can I do, it is better to say, what was he trying to do for me and say to me that I did not pay attention to? Take that in, and that's much better. You know, the same thing with my children, the same thing with my co-workers, the same thing with my bosses, the same thing with my neighbors. What were they trying to do for me that I did not pay attention to? And when I take that in, you know, that will overflow without discriminating, without counting the cost, without keeping a record, and without looking for a reward. You know, people will come to you years later, your children, your grandchildren, I, and I'll never forget what you said said, did I say that? <laughs> yes, you did. Because it came out of you. Did I do this? Yes, you did. But I don't even remember. <clears throat> and if you remember it, it's with gratitude. The other thing I also do is, some of the things I do remember, and I want to go to sleep with that gratitude. See, psychologically what happens is this, that 
in my, in my subconscious and my unconscious when I'm going to sleep, it's looking for other things to be grateful for. When I wake up in the morning, I always, my first thought in the morning is about God. It's my automatic kind of thing, you know. And I'm not saying this to impress you. It has been like this for the last 40 years of my life, you know. So you know I'm over 40. So, but anyway, so like, so for all these years, my first thought in my, when I, my waking moment is God, okay? So in my waking, in my, during my day, unconsciously, I'm looking for something or the other to be grateful for when I go to sleep at night. So going to bed with gratitude is something that is, and learning how to receive, receive. So when people are dying, I tell them, you have loved God all your life. Give God a chance to love you. Give God a chance to love you. See, sometimes our love for God our love for our spouses, our love for our children come in the way of love, of a loving relationship. Because we don't give the other person a chance to learn how to receive, receive, receive that love. You know? So give other people a chance and take in that love. You know? And that's why, again, you've heard me say this, when somebody says, I love you, don't go in an automatic and say, I love you too. The first thing would be to say, thank you. <coughs> you know, thank you. And then maybe to spend a little time, not every time, but every now and then to <coughs> tell them what their love means to you. You know, if you get it through an email, say, you know, because of your love for me, I'm a, I'm a totally different person. I feel supported. I feel cared for. I feel like, you know, I feel a free person. My life is rich because of your love, and I'm ever grateful, and I love you too. But don't go on, I love you, I love you too. I love you, I love you. I mean, I do it too. But, you know, if every time somebody says, I love you, I've got to spend 10 minutes listening to that, they're not going to say that to you anymore. <laughs> but find time, find a way, at least say, thank you, and I love you too. So you spend, at least break that moment of acknowledging, appreciating, receiving, so that it can overflow. Okay? So, how do I find my, so my, I, my, my identity, yes, if you're a child of God, then you're a divine heir. And if you cannot claim everything that God is and everything that God has, don't lie and say that you're a child of God. If you are a child and you mean it, claim your inheritance. Otherwise, don't call yourself a child of God. That's a lie. Okay? And God, by the way, wants to give us everything that God is and everything that God has that is infinite. <coughs> and here's the best part. The human soul is capable of receiving infinite God and infinite gifts. We don't believe that because we've been told we are sinners. <coughs> you know what is sin? Sin is when I forget who I am. That is not what I do. I do because I forget who I am. So sin is forgetting who I am. And when you know who you are, you will claim your inheritance. Okay, what about like Hinduism? In Hinduism or in the Eastern tradition, you know, um, there are two ways of, ex of, of, uh, of experiencing God. One is Aham Brahmasmi or Tattva Masi. Aham Brahmasmi is I'm Brahman, I'm, I'm the divine. I'm part of the divine. I'm part of the divine. Or Tattva Masi. You know, this I love. Because it is, how do you translate Tattva Masi? I am that. And that is me. So who is God for in, 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 the, in the Indian tradition? God is that. Not he, not she. Very personal. But God is that. And you know the one, the God who revealed himself to Moses? And he said, I am. You have to write it in English. So therefore the English sentence is, I am who am. But if you like, take it literally, it is, I am that. I am. So the God of the Bible is that. And that's beautiful. Then we won't fight about, like, you know, is he male or female, you know. Is he white or is he black? 
is he an old man with a beard out there in the sky? Or, no, it's that. You know, and so when you experience that and you find your identity in that, so God and I are not one, but God and I are not two. That's the Eastern tradition. Not one, not two. Now, by the way, St. Ignatius of Loyola also has the same experience of God. So for Ignatius of Loyola, who is a wonderful Catholic saint, you know, for him, at the end of our life, the goal of our life is to find our, our relationship with God like the, like the rays of the sun and the sun or the, or the waters of the fountain and the fountain. There are no rays without the sun. The rays have the identity only as being part of the sun. If you haven't understood that, St. Ignatius says, think about a fountain. There is no fountain without water, and water has its identity only as being part of the fountain. Therefore, there is no you unless you find your identity in God, in the divine essence. You know? So that is like that is uh, uh, Hinduism. What does the Quran say about like our relationship with God and who am I? The Quran says that God is closer to us than our jugular vein. God is closer to us than life, our life. So God and I, so therefore, the Muslim mystic, Kabir says, I laughed when I heard the fish in the water being thirsty. How can the fish in the water be thirsty? Kabir says, it is easier for us to understand fish in the water being thirsty than for a human being not experiencing God because God is closer to us than water is to fish. God is, says the Quran. Okay? I'm going to end with this last part. And this is the Buddhist story. This is the Buddhist story of the little wave. And so there's a, this little wave is on the ocean. And it's, and it's coming down, coming to the shore. And it sees all the other waves crashing. And it panics. It's yelling. It's screaming. And all the other waves are saying, what's your problem? He says, can't you see? We're all going to die. And the waves, the big waves tell the little wave, oh little wave, you're not just a little wave, you're part of the ocean. You're not just a little wave, you're part of the ocean. You know, this for me like gives me goosebumps because it's like, just think about it. You and I are not tiny little creatures. We are part of the infinite. God. We are part of the infinite universe. We are part of life. We are not just a tiny creature. We are not a little wave. We are part of the ocean. Now once you have that identity, tell me who can hurt you. Tell me what happens to all our hurts, our inner hurts. If we truly believe in our gut that I am the image and likeness of God, if we truly believe in, in at the core of our being that I'm the divine breath, if I truly believe that God and I are not one, but God and I are not two, you know, that I'm in God, you know, like those, like, you know, if you're Catholic and you go to Mass, at the offertory, <coughs> while you're counting your money and wondering how much money to put in that tray, there is, a, there is the priest that takes a drop of water and pours it into that wine. That's mystical. That drop of water is you. That wine is God. And when you receive communion, by the way, please don't receive Jesus, but receive the infinite God. Don't let that Jesus become an obstacle to your experience. Of <coughs> don't limit, you know, because communion is bigger than Jesus. You know, the, somehow the Christian tradition has got Freud you know, talk about regression. Look at the church's calendar. That Jesus, you come to resurrection and then you start again. You know, you regress again to becoming a baby. And you keep going back to becoming a baby. No, we need to grow up. Okay? All right. So you're not just a wave. You're, you're part of the ocean. So when I find my identity, no one can touch me. Now, will I be hurt? Yes. Will I be sad? Yes. Will I feel negative? Yes. But for how long? Yeah. Like give yourself 15 minutes, you know, for self-pity. And then the best invention of the human race is that toilet flush. 
<laughs> That's why you need to go and, and flush it. Don't carry it around because it stinks. <laughs> so, 15 minutes for self-pity, flush it out. Okay. Uh, let's, let's pause over here and take a break for, 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 for an hour. Uh, does that mean you want me to leave? <laughs> All right. Uh, so if you have any, if you have any questions or comments or clarification, I'll be happy to. So I don't want anybody to go away confused or anybody to go away kind of saying. I have a question. Yes. I lost what I lost what you meant by what were they trying to do for me and I didn't notice. Not pay attention to. Uh, okay, I'll give you I'll give you an example of that. One day like, you know, like grandma used to put this little grandchild to sleep every night. You know, read him stories and, you know, and all those nice things that grandmothers do. And, and after some time, one day, this little grandchild, he said, Grandma, I love you. And she said, ooh, I love you too. He says, no, Grandma, I love you. And she says, okay, you love me and I love you. And he said, Grandma, I love you. Then she realized she was taking away his moment. He was trying to express his love. That kind of came from deep within. But Grandma was too much in a hurry to say, oh, I love you too, and was discounting his love for Grandma. You know, sometimes our co-workers, you know, they try to reach out to us, and we say, no. They probably went out of their way to make you feel, to say something nice, to say something good. Thank you. Okay? All right. Um, everything you said sounds wonderful. But how do you get it from your head into your gut, into your heart? And you're happy when you're blue. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's seriously, you know, like, uh, like showboat begins with that whole song of, you know, just make believe. Make believe. That's one real way of just pretending to live a different life. And that which you pretend will become your reality. That's one of the ways of doing it. The other way of doing it is to be able to find, you know, to be able to find your, your mantra. You know, and to keep repeating it. Because when I grew up, you know, my religion told me that I was, uh, I was uh, full of sin. I'm going to use another S word, but, you know, but it was like, <laughs> full of sin, that, like, you know, that I was going to go to hell. I was not, so I couldn't appreciate anything good. So I did feel negative about myself. So I grew up with a very poor self-image and a very negative, like, you know, self -con Like, I had no confidence, like, I no. I knew I was gifted, but I just could not do anything right. Not anything right. I would do everything right, but one thing would go wrong, you know? So I grew up with that negativity. And so at that, and at that time, I grew up shy, until I realized that shy people are the most egocentric people in the world. So if you're shy, get therapy. Because, because when I was shy, I was evil. You know, because I was shy, I would, not, I would not accept to talk in public. But if somebody else came and spoke, I could cut them like fire. Because I was shy. You know, so I, so I was very distracted. You can be introverted. I'm introverted. I'm a very strong introvert. So I'm introverted, but I've stopped being shy. Okay, so my mantra that I got was, I'm important, I'm precious, and I've got something beautiful to offer. Mm -hmm. That was my first mantra, okay? So I would get up and say, important, precious, beautiful, important, <laughs> precious, beautiful. But in the beginning, when I kept saying that, 
There were times when I would wonder, says, who is this person, important, precious, and beautiful? Look at the way people have treated you. Look at, look, go and look at the mirror. Beautiful. Ugh. You've got this big nose, deep eyes. You look like a, like a monster. So that was the, you know, the, yeah. by the way, I'm a tractor. No, but, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, yeah I, like I, there's another talk that I give to my students about being attractive and beautiful. I said, if you're attractive and beautiful, you've got it made. But you have to choose between being attractive and beautiful, choose to be attractive and not beautiful. Because beautiful people are the most boring people you can ever find. It's good to have them around just to kind of put their pictures on the wall. Talk to them. Because beautiful people got attention without working for it. You know, they just said, mm -hmm. but when they grow up, but the rest of us, we had to develop some gift, some talent, you know, in order to get somebody's attention. And so we become attractive people. And we, as we age, we become more and more attractive. And beautiful people, all of a sudden, you know, their beauty wears out, and there are other beauty queens coming up. And so they are always, and we find that it's becoming a little too late. So, find your attractiveness. And our attractiveness is in our gifts. Okay? So I'm important, precious, and beautiful. Important, precious, and beautiful. So I would go like, you know. And in the beginning, I couldn't keep any friends, because I felt I was hopeless. But now, I would, uh, once I got my mantra, I would go on my bicycle, important, precious, beautiful, important, precious, beautiful. I would ring the bell, and I would say to myself, not to them. You know, if you've got time for me, lucky you. If you don't have time for me, poor you, because you're going to miss somebody who is important, precious, beautiful. <laughs> Guess what? They changed. Because they began to treat me like important, precious, and beautiful. Why? Because I felt important. So you've got to find your mantra. My mantra now is three little words, you are mine. Not you, God. They're saying, even you. But you know, if, God, if I accept God saying, you are mine, I feel this tremendous sense of belonging to God. That's my only security. You know, so if there is, if I feel low, if I feel down, if I feel negative, how do I put this thing from here to my, you know, to my heart and my gut? You are mine. You are mine. You keep repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, repeating it, until that it, it resounds, those waves, and that goes into your subconscious and your unconscious, and then you are, you know, it will work. Okay? And, by the way, the other thing I also tell people is, don't make it a project. Make it a play. Like, little, like a little child play. And if you fail, laugh. If you don't know how to laugh, Laughing Jesus. Good. Ah. So please don't make your spiritual life into a project. Make it into playtime. And you 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 do you fare much better. Otherwise you'll keep beating yourself up, don't keep scores, like, you know. Okay? Alright. Yes. Father, when I was young, I couldn't look in the mirror. I you know, I'd be washing my hands and turtle then I couldn't look too much. Like maybe a little like yourself, or maybe like a lot of us. Yeah. Now that I'm old, I can I look in the mirror, and I don't know if this is bold or too bold or not. But when I look in the mirror, I see Jesus looking back at me now, and I am laughing. Jesus is laughing with me. If I'm crying, Jesus is crying with me. And I've said that to people, a few people, and they look at me as if I'm you know, crazy. Kind of old, or just so, and I guess um, for me it, it, it helps. And so oh, that is that is absolutely phenomenal. It's beautiful. That's a gift. That is a gift. You know, just to look into, you know, into the mirror and see God looking at you. See here, coming from India, again we have what we call like you know the darshan. Darshan is to to look. You know, we have the Mumbai darshan, which is like the Bombay sightseeing. You know, but then you go and see, when you go and see a holy person and you go and see God, there are two things that happen. You see God, but you haven't seen God until you have allowed God to see you, to look into you. Okay? Now, St. John's Gospel, you know, there's all about come and see. We have seen the Lord. What does that mean? It's not just to see, but to allow yourself to be seen. You know, when I look at you and you look at me, you know, we've made contact. 
But if I only look at you and, and you don't look back at me, I've seen you, but there's no relationship. So the relationship is in the seeing, you know. Now, my only kind of prayer for you is, I hope your Jesus disappears and God comes in. Because Jesus is always there to point out to God and don't let that Jesus. And you're lucky to have Jesus that will cry with you. If I cry, my Jesus laughs. He'll say, ha! <laughs> and then you quit. You end up laughing. Yeah. So you end up quit. Okay? So no, that's a gift. One last thing. When you were saying, oh Lord, I am not worthy that you should come into me in my heart, only say the word. And I can do that, but I can't say, oh Lord, I am not worthy that you should come because I feel Jesus, God, at least God, not the most, has come. Yeah. And, and so it seems like we're called to say that. Right? I know. I don't. I don't either. So, you're a heretic. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get permission from someone. <laughs> By the way, I'm not a priest anymore. I know. So, you know. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, like, you know, it's like, you know, it's an invitation of God. If you're a child, you don't need an invitation. You're there. Otherwise, yes. Yes. Um, I still struggle with um, what you mean by essence. Um, and, you know, I can, I'm taking notes, obviously, trying to recall because my memory isn't what it used to be. And um, I've got down here image of God, divine breath. Um, and the essence. What is the divine, that, what is that the. I don't understand, you know. Uh, Sister Joan has said to me, at some point you will discover and know the little root fan within you instead of the grown root, um, and that that is your essence, but I, I can't get there. Okay, see, the way, the way I do it, or the way I did it, you know, is that I look at myself and I'm saying, who am I? So I'm not this, I'm not my body. You know, this body keeps changing, and this body will corrupt, this body will... Uh, like get into the dirt and it'll go away or it's constant. So that's not who I am, okay? I'm not my mind. My thinking is always changing. You know, my feelings change. You know, my, I'm not my, the things that I possess. So who am I? So what is it that kind of will remain forever? Now you'll be able to, the thing is, when you've experienced it, you will know. It's difficult to, ex to explain it, but I can only tell you how I got there, but I cannot tell you what it is. It's like, what's the taste of sugar? Sweetness. What is sweetness? Okay, all right. Yes? If you talk about the first six years of life, so other than intensive psychotherapy, I, I, just, I don't remember much, that's like past, you know, one to three, I don't remember much about what went on. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, pardon? No, I was just saying, Well, sometimes what happens is you can work backwards. You know, you say, why do I, what is, why is this pattern in my life? Like, you know, for me, why was this pattern of everything would go well, but one thing would go wrong? You know, so then I went back and I recognized that in my childhood. That, uh, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, like the Catholic Church, my father was taught that pride will take you to hell. So pride is that sin that will take you to hell. And which was translated as, be good for nothing. Be good for nothing. Don't appreciate anything good. So, yeah, so we were not allowed to say anything good about ourselves. You know, we are not allowed to accept anything good that we did. So if, if there was something good that we did, we had to find the fault. Or we had to show somebody else who's better than us. But that is like, you know, so then, so how did I come? And so I lived all my life as a cripple. You know, like this was like not allowing me to run or to fly, you know. How did I come to that? One day, I was watching the Olympics, you know, and there was the world's, the 100 meters race was about to begin. And the guys went on their marks, and I was there with them. Set, and I was running with the fellow who was the world's fastest runner. And my hair would stand on end as if I had won that race. 
soccer, you know, guys would go and score a goal, and I would, I failed as a pilot. And I went to spiritual direction to talk to my director about what was happening, about the Olympics. And he said, he knew me when I was in, like, in school. He said, I'll never forget you know, uh, a day in, in school. It was sports day, and I was the champion of the day. You know, I was carrying the championship trophy, my father was carrying my trophy, his mother, my sisters, my brother were carrying. I was the champion of the day. And he said, I went to my I went to your father and said, Congratulations, Mr. Coutinho. You must be proud of your son today. Proud. Who taught him that? The same guy who was saying, Congratulations, Mr. Kindley. So he said, You must be proud of your son today. My father said he did not win the cycling prize. Uh, the cycling prize, the cycling race. I was the champion of the day. Most of the places, first place, a few of second place. But, and even the cycling prize. You know, I had the daughter bike and somebody let loose, like to release some air before the race. But with that disadvantage, I wasn't last, but I wasn't among the first three. But for my father, thanks to this wonderful people who taught him, right, cycling prize. So we came home. And in our poor home, my mother set up, you know, put a table, put a little, like a, you know, sheet on top, and we displayed all the trophies, sat around those trophies, and what did we talk about? Cycling, Cycling prize. <laughs> <laughs> so, once I got that insight into myself, I went back to my childhood. And then I realized, in my relationship with God, I was a champion. But of course, you know, I'm flawed. But I have focus on in my relationship with people. I, you know, today I can say I'm an attractive man, you know, a very desirable man, tall, dark, handsome, smart, <laughs> caring. That's and if I don't say that, I'm insulting God. You know, when I was in Guam, that was the first time I said this to 125 teachers. And after I got familiar with them, like on the third day. And they said, you're crazy. I said, yeah, but not stupid. But, you know, <laughs> but if I don't say that I'm good, I'm insulting God. I'm insulting God. You know, so I would go, when I went back, yeah, now I rebuilt my past. Now I began to accept all the, all the good things that people said about me, all the good things that I did, you know, and I exaggerated it. Why? Because I exaggerated the negative things when people told me. And even the negative things, if they were not true, I soaked it in. So now, even if you flatter me, I'll take it in. <laughs> so even if it, is, if it is partially true, I'll take it in. But that's how I rebuild myself. So sometimes we can go backwards and say, why is this pattern in my life? And it's all likelihood you find it rooted in your childhood. You know, sometimes what you need to do is maybe talk Talk to people who are around and say, what do you remember about, you know? As siblings, we sit down sometimes and we do talk about our experiences, you know? So, and that kind of triggers memories. Okay? Thanks. Yes? Uh, I may have misunderstood you, but the first six years, God has the father figure, my father figure. Yeah, okay, here's what Freud says. Freud says that God is a projection of my father image. So the way I experience my father in the first six years of my life is the way I'll experience God. So if, supposing my father was absent, so God will always be absent. Now it doesn't mean that God is always, always has to be absent, but I, it helps me to understand. Others that childhood God keeps popping its head up. You know, it's an absent you know, it's an absent God. See, my, my voice and image of God, I projected my mother with authority and everybody. That's why I can't forget this out. It was always angry daughter, angry mother, in, in most of my authoritative. Okay, maybe like, you know, for you that it is, you know, it was like your mother was more significant than your father and was. she was more authoritative. Right. Authoritative than she Okay. Right. Okay. Yes. How about there is, how do you grow up in a dominant female house? Well, that's exactly what, you know, what uh, Sandy was saying. So then, now, if you take that, if you take that, uh, like, Freud seriously, then your God is like 
you know, he's, he's useless. Like the men in the house were like, they didn't have much of a place. So your God doesn't have much of a place. Other people, other things, you know, will. So your, your God is not, cannot really do much for you. <coughs> if you take Freud serious. Oh, okay. If you take Freud serious. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to be that way. So if you think that is, it's only to help you to understand. That's why I said I don't, I don't fully agree with, with what Freud is saying, but he does have, like, you know, certain things to think about. I'm certain, certain who the role model was a male role model in my life. I'm thinking for my son, who has five sisters and me and never had a male role model. And I'm thinking, he didn't have one. What is he, what is he going to grow up to be think, you know, now that he's a teenager? That's why I was asking. Uh -huh. Yeah, often what happens is there is a kind of an absent, you know, like in a, a father who's not around, you find a God that is like kind of absent, or a God will show up every now and then, a God you got to go constantly searching and looking for, yeah. looking for him. But so how do you guide a 17-year-old teenager or something like that, being that I am the most prominent in his life? I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm the rock. Yeah. Well, to be able to, like, you know, to be able to, to guide them to say, well, you know, like God is neither father nor mother. God needs to be that, okay. you know. So God needs to be like father and mother limits God. Like when you say our father, yeah, I mean like you're limiting God. I mean even Thomas Aquinas says, whatever we know about God, like we, we know, uh, what is that? Uh, we know God by what who God is not. So is God father? No. Is God mother? No. Okay, God is much bigger than that. So even in the Indian tradition, we have neti neti, not this, not this. So God is this and not that. So that's why in our Indian tradition, you know, we kind of, when we, you, you guys will not be able to do this. Your heads and your necks are not. <laughs> and this, our whole spirituality in our culture is in this. You ask me, are you happy? Yes no. It is yes and no. So we live and do this with, like, you know, with uh, contradictions and paradoxes and multiplicity because we shake our heads. So you say, is God Father? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Is God the universe? Great pardon? Is God the universe? Um, say a little more. I think you have something behind that question. What do you think? I believe the universe is just out there. It, it's bigger than anything you can believe. And God is too. And God isn't causing hurricanes and floods. And no, no, no. That's happening, and that's the universe. And if you ask him to help you, he'll respond. Oh, no. In fact, God never answers our prayers. I mean, if you think God is hearing your prayers, forget it. I mean, that's ridiculous. Uh, I feel like I have a direct line. I'm about to... <laughs> okay, let me let me explain that. We answer our own prayers by the gift and the power that God has given us. So yes, we pray, but God doesn't hear our prayers. We answer our own prayers by the gift that God has given us. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. It's like otherwise, like, you know, there are two teams playing and we're both praying and one team wins. Like so, and then think about it. You know, you're praying and you're saying, and then God gives you like little crumbs and you're saying, okay, what kind of a God is that? And he said, I'll give you a little now, but not, yes. What about like evil and the devil? Where, where's your, your standing? Look at me. I'm the devil. <laughs> well, the devil is like, I do believe that there is kind of, you know, that there is negative energy in human nature. Now, that's the devil? No. It's part, like St. Paul says, you know, the things that I want to do, I don't do. The things that I hate doing are the very things I find myself doing, which means there's another spirit within me. So there is like, you know, and, okay, now that you brought that up, you know, it is, um, so the devil and the angel and God is all within us. You know, so we can, so when I think evil, when I think negativity, I'm spreading negative energy into the universe. 
And if somebody acts negatively, in all likelihood, they are soaking up my energy and act it. Similarly, with positive energy, I can also change the world. That's why, like, you know, Joe has printed out a little, like, sheet there. We would like to have, you know, at least one million people who can commit themselves to two minutes of peace every day. Just to think about peace, will peace, do it as a game. Don't say, oh, I'm distracted. Forget it. It's okay. You know, as long as you have this intention of two minutes a day of letting loose positive, peaceful vibrations into this world, the world will change. It will overcome the negative. So, I don't believe in the devil. In fact, you know, the, that serpent in the Garden of Eden was not Satan. <coughs> Till the five, five centuries, they never talked about the, the serpent as Satan. It was only in the fifth century, in Alexandrian Judaism at that time, they turned the serpent into <coughs> Satan. Until that time, that serpent was from India. We worship the serpent. <laughs> it is a symbol of wisdom. Oh, the serpent is a symbol of wisdom. And in the Garden of Eden, that serpent is wisdom. Read the text. What's the wisdom means? Wait, pardon? So how is he wise in the garden? How is he wise in the garden? Yeah, I mean, doesn't he doesn't need to say. No, no, he didn't ask Adam because Adam was a nutcase. He asked Eve. <laughs> what did he ask Eve? He asked Eve. So what did what did No, he didn't ask. He asked Eve. So what did God say? And, he, and Eve said, God said we could eat of every fruit from the from the garden except the tree in the middle. Okay, it was not an apple. Oh, sorry. Okay. So it was just because you got no. This, that came from <laughs> not in the, Okay, that the forbidden fruit. Yep, forbidden. Okay. So first of all, first of all, the first line of that third chapter of Genesis says, you know, if you read the Bible, it says, and the the serpent was the most crafty of all yep. the creatures mm -hmm. that the Lord God had made. Yep. Okay. What did you hear? God made the serpent. Uh huh. And God saw that the serpent was good. Now the original Hebrew word is not crafty. The original Hebrew word is arum. And arum means that the serpent had secret knowledge that no other creature that God had made had. It was not crafty. It was not cunning. It was not, that was the, that is a, that's a Christian Catholic translation. So it's... So Wait, let me finish. <laughs> let me finish. So he goes to the woman. Why to the woman and not the man? Because he's talking about wisdom. And wisdom is intuitive. Wisdom is not, you cannot get it with the man's rational mind and logic. It's intuition. Just as the resurrection is intuition. That's why the men didn't get it and they still don't. But women kind of you know, get it because resurrection is intuition. So he goes to the woman and says, and so the woman, and so the the serpent tells the woman, if you eat of that, you know, it's, Eve says, if we eat it, or if we even touch it, we will die. Remember, they eat, not only touch, they eat it, and they don't die. They don't die. Read the text. So the serpent says, if you eat it, God knows that your eyes will be open, and you will be like God. You know, knowing good and evil, so you will become like God. So they eat it, and then they realize that they're naked. What is nakedness? Transparency. Their eyes were open, and now they realize who they really were. Image of God, likeness of God, the essence. Okay? So are you saying then that before their eyes were open, they didn't have a clue as to who they were? They were ignorant. They so, were okay. Doing? So this is a myth, right. okay? But a myth to tell you a deeper truth. Right. Right. So what is sin? Sin is ignorance. So before their eyes were opened, they were in ignorance and they were in sin. When their eyes were opened, you know, they recognized, they were conscious and they recognized who they were. Okay, then they go and, like, you know, they go and hide. And God says, yeah. see, one of the things you've got to realize is this, that that God in the Garden of Eden is not the supreme God 
He's one of the many gods in the pantheon that existed in the Bible. Read Joshua chapter 24, verse 2. You know, I, mean, I could be a Protestant quoting, and I can say whatever you want. If you're Catholics, you won't have a clue. <laughs> so Joshua chapter, uh, chapter 24, verse 2 tells us that Abraham worshipped many gods. So there were many gods there in the Bible. So this is like one of that many gods that is like fighting for his position in the pantheon. Knowing that Adam and Eve, or the first man and woman, were also made like God, but he wanted to keep them in their place. So, anyway, then this God put skins on top of them, and now, what is the purpose of life? To get rid of these skins, to go beyond male, female, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, to be able to come to my essence. So the, whole, this, this, the, the skins are put, like, you know, um, okay, then they eat, and then their eyes are open. Then Adam calls his wife Eve. If you read the Bible, he says, because she was the mother of all the living, not the dead. But the original Hebrew is because she became the source of life. Because she ate the forbidden fruit of knowledge and consciousness. But here's the whole thing, you know, here's the thing. Whose book is that? It's not the Christian book. It's the Jewish book. So let's see what the Jewish tradition talks about that myth. The Jewish tradition talks about, in the Garden of Eden, there are two trees. The tree of knowledge and the tree of life. The Jewish tradition says that the tree of life is surrounded by the tree of knowledge. The Jewish tradition says the purpose of life is to reach the tree of life, and the path to the tree of life is to eat the forbidden fruit of knowledge and consciousness. And every time you touch the fruit of knowledge and consciousness, says the Jewish tradition, you will be punished, alienated, and made to suffer, not by your enemies, but by the people who love you most. Jesus was killed by his own people. Mahatma Gandhi was killed by the Hindus. By the people who love, let me give you an example. Like here I see there's only one color besides mine. Okay? Now, Supposing like, you know, your children come and study with, with me and they have this consciousness to say, oh, we've got to go beyond color and race. And then, now they find a nice, either, I mean, I've had problems with, you know, parents who come to me about the blonde girls dating Indian doctors. And like, you know, it creates a big, a, like big a commotion in the family. But what if like, you know, say an Indian guy or like, you know, an African American. Your wonderful white girl has fallen in love with an African-American boy. And she comes home for Thanksgiving and says, Mom, look what I got. <laughs> of course, mothers kind of look at it and say, Oh, gee, now what are we going to do? <laughs> but mothers get over this pretty quick. Fathers are devious. Fathers can find it very difficult to accept it, but they don't have the guts to say it to them, to their, to their child. So what do fathers say? No, not ask your mother. They will say, they will say, what is going to go to, what, will, what is grandma going to say? Do you want to kill her? <laughs> no, you don't have the guts to say, I, know, I cannot deal with this. But you'll bring grandma into the picture to say, like, you know, she's, what is she going to feel? She's going to die. New knowledge, consciousness, and, uh, you know, with, you'll be punished, alienated, and made to suffer. You know, by what about the you know the, like parents who all of a sudden have children who say, you know, Ma, I'm gay or I'm lesbian, and they kind of you know, they're struggling with that, and now you say, of course you you have this knowledge and you start saying, what did I do wrong? What did I like? And you start blaming yourself and you do go through all that kind of. Anyway, but I'm, so new knowledge and I'm only talking about this. Try new knowledge and consciousness with your theology. And guess what will happen to you? Your theology about God, your theology about the Trinity, your theology about anything. I'm a nerd. I don't have to believe the Pope and all that. Forget about the Pope. Like, you know, you've got to think about like, you know, your neighbors and your children and you know, other people and your friends to say, oh my God, oh, she doesn't like, you know. So your best friends will start questioning you about your beliefs. So anyway, so 
So the goal of so the Jewish tradition that the Catholics have taken and made it into this whole original sin like you know crap, you know, is very different. The Jewish tradition is a very positive picture of the Garden of Eden. The, the, it's a tradition that invites you to greater knowledge and greater consciousness in order to be healed within and in order to be free, to find yourself that goes beyond skins, that goes beyond like you know, differences of male and female, Americans and Indians, young and old. We need to be able to find that our essence. So, because I'm really ignorant about Adam and Eve goes on to the Cain and Abel story, right? Is that a separate story, really? It's like it's Bible history, and it's 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 a whole story of like did Cain and Abel really exist? Maybe, maybe not. You know, if you take it literally, yes, Cain and Abel. Cain killed his brother Abel. Where did all the other children come from? <laughs> The, 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 uh, the Genesis was was written. The book of Genesis was written during the Babylonian exile. And what I'm kind of hearing you say, Paul, is that well, in, in, in the Jewish tradition, the, their viewpoint really was kind of a book of hope. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah, of, and maybe a hope born of the conditions that they were yes. in. Yes, yes. But you know, if you make the I'm here. Anyway, we don't, don't want to make this a Bible study, okay. but it's like, you know, if you take the first five books of, of Genesis, there are four different stories that are intertwined mm -hmm. into, into that, into the story, into the Bible. Okay? Thank you. All right. Yes? I'm still, I'm still back on this stuff. Um, I've, you know, done some reading on it, trying to discover, and uh, supposedly the ego is not your essence, and can you explain that? You think that's just a bunch of bones? No, there is like, you know, I, mean, I have a certain ego, a certain right. notion of myself. Is that not my essence? It's not. When you find your essence, everybody else I'll will let know. You know. No, 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 no. <laughs> you didn't hear what I said. I said, when you find your essence, everybody else will know. So keep searching. All right. One more. <coughs> when I was in Montana, there was another uh, a Jesuit at time from India. And he gave us the same story from Adam and Eve, but he said that when the devil said, when you eat this fruit of the tree of good and evil, you will become my God. And so that he, I guess, was saying that the real original sin and the real sin of all of us is that we don't believe it and yeah. we haven't accepted it. Yeah. And Adam Eve didn't either because she wanted more and she yeah. wanted some more proof. Right. Okay. Right. You're in line with the other. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. yes. <laughs> I'd like to get more into some more concrete um, tools on the inner healing instead of the Bible. I'm more interested in the inner healing. That's how I feel. Um, so you talked about like talking with siblings and so forth. Uh, do you have more concrete tools that you could work on within yourself? I mean, you talked about being, you know, triggered, I'm going to use that word, and realizing something is there, but you are talking about very young ages. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. as in more concrete, like dominant writing, coloring, I mean, I, I'm just curious to what your thoughts yeah, are. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm not into like, you know, there is like art journaling and coloring and, you know, you kind of, there is also the whole thing about dreams and, you know, the different ways of, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't make it so complex. I would simply say, recognize something and look for something more. Recognize something, look for something deeper, but don't stop. Mm -hmm. Just keep going and going and going, and one day you will find it. You know, like ask the questions, but don't be satisfied. But well, what do you do with the pain? Just forgive it? I mean, sometimes. The pain? The pain of what may come up. There has to be something concrete to work with that pain. You can't just say, I forgive you, pain, because the pain is, is there, it's real. I mean, sometimes you can go into something that's real painful and really can almost debilitate you until, like, I can't do anything until I deal with this. 
Okay, there are, doesn't good. So there are two things that the Buddhists say about pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they say pain that is resisted becomes <coughs> suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. So if you flow with the pain, you know, you will find wisdom and you'll find enlightenment. There's yeah. gift in pain. But if you resist the pain, it will become suffering. So you're saying just flow with the pain? Take any pain. No, look for the wisdom and the gift in the pain. Okay. So let's say, for example, like in relationship, if somebody has betrayed, betrayed you, you know, like somebody that you really gave your life to has either eloped with somebody or Great, the other. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's happening in my life. <laughs> Not the eloping. But <laughs> you could have said, oh, my husband eloped with my best friend, or how I miss her. But anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. So, supposing this is an example that I give in a relationship, if something kind of you know goes wrong, and I was fully committed, and I feel cheated, I feel the person kind of you know, or the person just died. Now, what is the gift in this? In the gift, when if you sit back in the pain, you will realize that when somebody loves you, they don't make you happy. But they make you aware of the source of your happiness that is within you. So if they go away, it is painful, but they don't take your happiness with them. So of course, when I was teaching at the university, as soon as the class was over, what do you know? One of my, my girls goes to her boyfriend and says, you don't make me happy. And the guy makes face became small. And he asks you obvious questions. So why do you stay with me? And she said, well, she says, you know, because you love me, I am growing. I'm growing up to be a beautiful person. Mm. My qualities, I love them and, and I'm growing. My negative part of my personality, I can look at it, I can accept it, and I keep growing. Okay? But if anything happens in this relationship, you know, it'll be painful, but you're not taking my happiness with you. And she said, I hope I'm doing the same thing for you. Now that is kind of, you know, I mean, that is like nobody makes us happy. They make us aware of, because we don't give anybody power over our happiness, our sadness, our hurts, etc. We do it to ourselves. So the pain of a relationship, okay, that's one. The second thing that, okay, let's take other examples. The economy, economy is in a mess. What's the, what's the, what's the gift? I start realizing that I can live with a little less than what I used to have before. You know, that I value things a little more than I would do before. What about sickness? What if I had cancer and like when I was given six months to live? What is the, it is painful. What is the gift? The gift is I live life as more fully than I would have if I was said I could live forever. The second principle, the Buddhist, so the Buddhists say pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. The second Buddhist wisdom is Whenever something happens, something painful happens, rather than asking the question, why, you need to ask your question, the question, now that it has happened, how do I want to live the rest of my life? So it is good to ask the question, why, but for how long? Okay, why did this happen? But if I sit for 10 years asking, why did this happen, you're going to be miserable. <laughs> rather than saying, now that this has happened, you know, how do I want to live the rest of my life? You know, one time I was talking to three widows, and you know, the next Sunday was like, the widow's might. So I asked them, so what's the wonderful thing about being a widow? Oh, they got into it, like one said, oh, I can get up whenever I want, I can cook whatever I want, I don't have to think about this. And the other one said, and all of a sudden, they realized they were having too much fun. And they said, oh, no, no, we also miss him. <laughs> but if you're sitting, if you're sitting just to kind of, you know, to, and I'm not saying, the thing is, see, the, this is the other thing. Death is the end of a life, not a relationship. The relationship continues even after the person dies. So that death is the end of a life, not a relationship. Relationship continues. In fact, after the person dies, the person becomes more alive in the relationship than when the person was. Like my parents, they're dead. But they're more alive now than when they were alive. You know, when they were alive, I'd have to say, oh, when am I going to call them? When am I going to see them? No, now they're always at me. There's a kind of, you know. So 
rather than asking why, you ask yourself, now that this happened, like supposing you're driving on the highway, there's an accident. And you say, like, why did this have to happen on my highway? I can understand accident, but why my highway? No, there's nothing you can do about it. So rather than asking, why did this happen, you say, okay, now that this has happened, how do I want to spend my time? How do I want to deal with it? And you have a more positive approach to life. So pain is a fact of life. Misery is a choice. Misery is a state of mind. Okay? Yes. Can you repeat the pain that is resisted okay. becomes suffering? Pain that is resisted becomes suffering. Pain that is not resisted always purifies and enlightens. Purifies and enlightens. Thank you. That's the Buddhist way of dealing with. Talk about healing, you know. It helps. So it doesn't mean I'm going to sit and do nothing. No, let me do as much as I can, and then. And there's always, like, you know, gifts you can find. Um, so not often, but uh, when out of nowhere, uh, for instance, when I was teaching, I was teaching religion, sometimes this thing comes up and says, do you really believe this? As you're teaching it, do you really believe this? Right. And, and you say, and of course, no. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's why I teach. Those who cannot do, teach. <laughs> no, seriously. There are certain times when you start saying this, and, and if you have said it often enough, you're saying, wait a minute. Is this? I don't, this is true, but maybe not fully true. Mm -hmm. So I need to think about it. Mm -hmm. And that's how we grow, you know? So there is always more, there's always more, there's always more. So doubt is a gift. To doubt is to be alive. Oh, okay. If you don't doubt, you're dead, you're existing. <laughs> so if you have doubts, you're, you're, you're living. If you don't have doubts, you're, you're existing. Doubt is good. Questions are good. I mean, for me, doubt is, I told you, my father gave me the gift of questions. So he had questions. Until the very end, you know, the day before he died, he had a question. He always asked me, he said, you know, uh, my mother died 12 years before he did. So uh, he would, I said, so what is going to happen to me when I die? Will I be with her? Will she see me? What is going life going to be like? And I said, well, he said, he said, don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> you haven't been on the other side. <laughs> so my father was very clear. Like, I mean, you know, for him, the questions were important. The answers would find him. So even if I tried to give answers. And the day before he died, he asked me the last question. You know, he was talking and walking and talking. He told us he was going to die when he was 86. So what do you know? In his 86th year, he got up and died. So, I mean, you know, it, he was, and he lived it. He lived a full life. He lived till he died. Um, the day before he died, he asked me, he said, you know, when Jesus appeared to Mary Magdalene, he, had the, he was the same person, but his body somehow was transformed. Do you think that's what will happen to me when I die? Will that happen to me? And by this time, I had learned to say, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> maybe. The two disciples on the road to Emmaus, you know, same Jesus, mm -hmm. they didn't recognize. Will that happen to me when I die? And I said, and I believe that was his answer to what will happen after he died. And the next day, he just died with a smirk on his mouth, on his face, mm -hmm. then to say, I did it. Mm -hmm. okay. Joe? We're close to the end of our reservation while you're all being quiet. If I could just say, on this is the new email. Yeah. It's Paul's, what is that, Paul's, be served. please pledge at gmail.com. If you would like to be involved with any more of these, we have two more announced, and at the end of that, July, we were going to have people that wanted to come together and say, how can we try to make this million dream possible, and, and to do that. We have 12 more reservations after that, with topics not yet announced. If you do this, all the rest of these, you will be able to have the opportunity for a reserved seat if you so choose. 
those reserved seats, though, will be released 15 minutes before the announced time. We have some dates at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, some on Saturday morning, afternoon. We're trying different times to see different people that can come. Anyway, thank you very much. I think we need to break here if you want to talk to Paul now. Okay. We appreciate Paul doing this. You know, I have, I have a, you know, I have a kind of an email, like uh, that I send out an email blast to announce anything that I'm doing or anything that happens. So if you want your name, you know, if you want me to send information, just write your, maybe if you write your uh, email address on a sheet of paper and give it to me. Uh, if you give me one of those sheets, we can use the back of that. Uh, or leave it at the leave it at the back there maybe. Well, if they send us an email to that, it's done. We got it. Yeah. Then we won't have. To so do you have copies for everybody with that? Sure. Yes. But Stan, do you have a copy with everybody? This? Yeah. Why well, I made uh, as many as there are people here. So anyway, so if you would like, you know, just write your email address here, and I will add it to that. Uh, and so if there's anything that I'm that I'm doing or anything that I, I will not send it to you, you know, every week, no. <laughs> and try to get the word out. We have 150 seats for the June 30th. Paul, are you teaching? I teach at Slew and at a community college this time. Which community? Yeah, I'm looking for. Oh, yeah? I know. I think, uh, are you familiar with Palatine, which we have a second? They are the new director.